Well, good to see everybody. We're going to continue with John today. Hoping we'll have some time for some comments. Uh, I do have, uh, seems just a tad loud, I'm not sure. But, uh, <clears throat> Last week we did some intro stuff, and I hope to kind of weave some of that in through the weeks, uh, some of the theme things, at least, that are interesting, at least to me. So I hope hopefully they'll mean something to you. Uh, just kind of a general review real quick. You know, last week we talked a little bit about what most call the prologue, the first 18 verses of John, which we think of when we say, in the beginning was the word. And goes on to talk about the life, light and life, and uh, how we will become children of God. And then John's testimony of Jesus, testimony about himself and about who Jesus was. And then the first disciples at the end of chapter one, chapter one, and a little bit about Nathaniel and Jesus' uh, vision, if you want to call it that, where he sees Nathaniel before he even comes, and know where he knows where he been, he's been, and and uh, that'll relate to something else we're going to talk about today. Then we touched on water to wine last week, Cana, and. Uh, I apologize, I didn't have any epiphanies this morning in terms of videos, like uh, if anybody wasn't here, search for uh, the bird, the bird is a word, and you'll see what I'm talking about, if you want to laugh. Uh, let's see. Oh, water to wine. I, this has nothing to do with anything. I just think it's amazing, having been through a few weddings with our kids, and, and one, of, one of our kids, I had a lot of wine because the wife really likes wine, and she knows a lot of people that had uh, that are winemakers. So she was gifted in a number of cases. And uh, we, we got to store a whole bunch of the stuff after the wedding. And we were just talking the other day, they've been married, what, three years? And they just finally got rid of all this leftover wine that they had. But thinking about these six containers that hold 20 to 30 gallons, just couldn't help but figure it out, the nerd in me. Six to 900 bottles of wine. 50 to 75 cases of wine. Even if it is an all-week wedding, that's quite a bit of wine, I think. Anyway. And then afterwards, it just simple statements, and the disciples believed. And we will see that come up a lot. Uh, this week, we'll be finishing out chapter 2, and which covers uh, Jesus and disciples going to Jerusalem for the Passover. Um, the first Passover mentioned, which is not mentioned in any of the other Gospels. We'll visit the money changers, the, the Jews, the Jesus throws out the money changers and the Jews' reaction. Then chapter 3, Nicodemus will meet him, and we'll have John's, the Baptist, final witness. And then the Samaritan woman, and then healing the official son in chapter Four. So we will finish chapter four, even if I have to say chapter four, Jesus did stuff. You know, it'll be depending on how long we did we get here. Um, <clears throat> I want to pass out a couple things. Gary, would you help me with this? I know probably many of you know these areas. I'm passing out a map that, uh, tell you what, I'll take a few of these. Yeah, I could. Twyla, would you mind passing? This is the text again. As far as the handout, I decided to pass out the text each week. If that's not helpful, let me know. Well, let me tell you could tell me if it's helpful. I find when I'm looking at my phone in a class, I see the three or four or five verses and I can zip around pretty well. But sometimes when you're talking, kind of, when you're going through kind of fast and you're summarizing, it's good to be able to, me, just visualize the whole thing and to jump over to another passage real quick. So hopefully that's helpful for you. Um, and then uh, I did the, the, the red letter with Jesus, Jesus' words, because I think we're, it's going to be, it's pretty amazing to me as we start moving along through John, how much of it turns to just Jesus is the one that's speaking. So, and then the map, uh, a lot of you, I was starting to say, a lot of you are probably more familiar with this area than I am. Since, But since John seems to follow this flow of geography between Cana 
Galilee and, and Jerusalem and goes back and forth for at least the first seven chapters. Um, I thought it'd be interesting just that if you want to see where a city is, it's mentioned, and you can kind of see how he, he, he does that. And, and I've found little differences in the geography that you wouldn't think you would, but these are big areas. Uh, anywhere from 60 to 90 miles from Galilee to Jerusalem, depending on where you're where you're going to. So when he you're in Galilee, and we'll have a passages like this today where they're in Galilee or Cana, and all of a sudden they go to Jerusalem. It's not like they went across the street. I mean, this was this was a pretty good trek. And for those of you that are kind of geeks like me or cynical like me, on the passages that say he went up to Jerusalem, it, it really is up. It's even though it's south, most of us would say up to Dallas when we think of north as up, but it's it's altitude wise it's up i think uh, i read different things there too depending on but 2000 feet or so depending on where you're at so it's a trek uphill so we'll start in chat well we'll finish up chapter two real quick and i will be summarizing these i, I want to say again if somebody has a, a thought something that they've looked at these passages and something that just really stands out to you and i don't cover it or you you want to spend more time on it just just jump in there but I'm going to summarize certain sections, and then uh, hopefully we'll spend a little bit of time in discussion. And if we have time, we'll have a video for today. But it's not from the 60s, and it's not a rock group. But I, th I know you'll enjoy it. Okay, we're starting in 213. We just finished up with a wedding, and it starts with the Passover of the Jews was at hand. And so Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and it's implied with the disciples. He goes to the temple and he finds all these people selling sacrifices and exchanging money and making good money while they're doing it, charging a lot. And so a lot of the people who are coming here are poor. This isn't in the text, but if you if you studied this, uh, the, <clears throat> it was it was pretty common for the quote money changers to be taking advantage, especially of the poor who would come and want to make sacrifices. And and so Jesus is upset at this. He throws them out. The disciples remember that. Uh, the Messiah is going to have this zeal for God's house, for the temple. And then we have the Jews' reaction, and they ask him, you know, how, by whose authority do you do this? And I'm intrigued all the way through John how G Jesus doesn't answer the question directly. He, he doesn't ask them, tell them by whose authority. He just says, destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it. Uh, so then there's this discussion, how are you going to do this? It took 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to do this. And then the narrator, John, yeah. uh, simply says, they don't really explain it other than to say, then the disciples after after the resurrection remembered that Jesus had said this, and they believed. And so we have this word again that they they believed. Um. So then we ship in, shift into 23 to 25, which is a little transition. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the feast, many believed in his name because of the signs he was doing. And I, I read just kind of past this little section many, many times over the last couple of months and just kind of moved on. Okay, that's a nice little transition. But then I spent a little time on this, but Jesus on his part did not entreat entrust himself to them. Some some translations say commit themselves to, the, to, him, to them because he knew all people and he knew what was in man. And I happen to look up this word entrust. Now, this probably won't be a big surprise to you, but it was kind of a surprise to me. What's the word in John that is over a hundred times? Pistuo. Trust, faith, believe. This is literally not pistuo. It's not two words. It's a word, one word that means not pastoral. So all through John, you've got this thing about trust, belief. Just a minute ago, we heard they believe, and that's pastoral. And now we have Jesus did not pastoral in them. And you can, I think you can infer because it just said they believe because of the signs. He knew that they were, their faith was pretty shallow. Here's this big, spectacular sign. Wow, this is the guy. But then when the rubber meets the road, I mean, we all know that, how that is in our life. 
something something hard happens really hard and that, that's you look at your face different it can cause you to look at your face different so now that's the end of chapter two we will move on to three how many have we're going to meet nicodemus pharisee ruler of the jews how many have seen the chosen there's a few there's this little cult of people who watch the chosen. No. If you this series, this series is about Jesus, but it's really a lot of background on the disciples and how they became disciples. And uh, <clears throat> we were told about it a couple of years ago. I was just telling Jen this, and it's going, oh, it's going to be another corny show. I just don't know, you know. And I'm such a cynic, you know. I just if I feel like. It's going to be like the Hallmark Christmas Christmas movies, you know, where there's a thousand and one Hallmark Christmas movies. <clears throat> and so we didn't watch it. Well, Danny was telling us a couple of weeks ago, and I kind of didn't want to watch it because I'm already chasing enough rabbits. We start watching this week. And if you haven't seen it, I mean, I have drank the kool It is, It is awesome. And uh, we're going to show, if, if I don't talk too much, we're, uh, which is hard to do, we're going to show a, a little clip from one of the episodes later. Uh, but I mentioned this was Nicodemus, and I have all my notes, you know, about him before. And and I don't know that they were that far off uh, in one sense, but just visualizing. I'm a visual learner and just seeing it. Uh, <clears throat> here's this Pharisee. We've just had this incident where the Pharisees are asking Jesus, by whose authority do you do this? And they're skeptical. And you've got these people coming to him and believing. And you can imagine the Pharisees do have a uh, position they, in that culture and, and what was going on. They had uh, prestige. I mean, they had power. They probably had money. Many of them were pretty well off. And here's this person who's coming in, and he's not praising the Pharisees for sure. We haven't gotten into much of that yet, but th there's a lot of questions. But the the insinuation is here that the Nicodemus has seen some of these signs or has heard about them. And he comes at night, and I, I know we've had lessons about this. I know Danny's done some. Coming at night is symbolic. I mean, you can imagine he's sneaking over there because he doesn't want to be seen. You know, I don't know if I should be seen with this person. <clears throat> and... Uh, so he comes over and he asks a question, and it's unlike, I don't know if we see this much in John, but in the other Gospels, usually when a Pharisee comes over, there's a kind, you kind of get an indication it's to trick Jesus. Matter of fact, it may say that even. In this one, he says, he says, I know you're with God. Let me see if I can find the exact passage here. Rabbi, we know you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs uh, that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answers them. And again, I find it funny. Well, he comments that he's from God. And Jesus doesn't really, I don't know that he really comments on that, in my opinion. It's just kind of, he, he starts shifting into, truly, truly, I say, to you, say unto you that uh, no one can be born again unless, if he cannot see the kingdom of God. I said that totally wrong. I need my glasses. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus asked, how? Well, how can this be born again? And Jesus goes into this idea of being born of the Spirit and truth. And so then Nicodemus asks again, how can these be? And that's kind of the last we have of him right now. And Jesus goes into more teaching. But it's uh, you don't get the sense that he's challenging Jesus. You get the sense that he's genuinely perplexed, or at least that's always been my perception. And I think in the reason I mentioned in the chosen, you really get you really see this, the quandary he's in, and just his mind just doing backflips, trying to figure out how can this be? What does this mean for everything I've been teaching? For who I am, for what I do, for what we do. Uh, <clears throat> and Jesus goes on to teach. Uh, this is starting in verse nine, ten. And uh, I just want to hit a couple of these. He talks about only the man, only the Son of Man has ascended into and descended from heaven. 
the Son of Man must be lifted up as Moses. I'm reversing the order here, but just to put the point, as Moses lifted the serpent. And if you don't recall this in Numbers, the Jews had been grumbling in the desert, mad about everything. Why didn't we just stay in Egypt and all that? And God sends serpents, snakes, and they die. They're killer. I mean, you know, they're poisonous. People are dying. And God has Moses creates this, I think it's bronze serpent, put it on a post and hold it up. And everyone who looks at the serpent, who's been bit by the serpent, this is one thing that's specific, is healed. So the serpent isn't for everybody. It's for everyone who's been bit. I thought that was interesting when I looked at this verse. Because Jesus must be lifted up. Feel free to correct me on that. These are my interpretations. Okay. Uh, then Jesus goes in to, well, let me jump in. Let me back up and finish this first part. Then Jesus continues with a verse that you know we all know is at every football game. For God so loved his world, loved the world that he sent his only son, and that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Before I get back to this idea of the serpent, uh, eternal and uh, best I can find, it's not referring, the word doesn't refer to a future event. It's almost like an ageless event is what comes up over and over in, in the in the Greek lexicons, it meaning it's timeless, that we have this life now that, that is now and forever. But it, it doesn't start down there, but we have this life. And that, that relates to passages where Jesus talks about you might have life and have it abundantly you know, to me. But then we get back in this passage. This is in verse 19. And he says, Jesus says, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And I'm going to skip down to 21. But whoever does, does what is true comes to the light so that he may be clearly seen as work. Excuse me, I pulled the wrong one. Boy. He, he talks about the judgment, people who, uh, the light has come into the world, but the people love the darkness and their deeds were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out and in God. <clears throat> And I should have put down verse 18 because this was kind of my tie-in. Whoever believes in him, this is right after uh, talking about the sun coming into the world. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned and condemned already. Same idea of the ones who are saved are those who believe in him. But the ones who do not believe, they were already condemned. It's kind of the same thing as to me as being bit bit by the snake. Is if you're bit by the snake, you're condemned. And you need that salvation. People who don't believe are already condemned, is is kind of the long way I'm saying this. Because we've are and that's all of us. We have until we believe. We've all been bitten by sin. Anyway, I don't know if that works for you, but that was my thought. So we're going to move on now that I've messed that one up. After this, in 22, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside. And this is the final text we have from John the Baptist. And John is baptizing, and his disciples get a little upset because more people are going to Jesus than are going to you. And John... Just to summarize, he, he reminds them, I told you I wasn't the Christ. And Jesus must increase, de increase, I must decrease. He gives this illustration of the, like the friend of a bridegroom. I must be happy for his joy. I think that's kind of a neat illustration to me because whether it's the bride or the, or the groom, if that's your friend to getting married, chances are, I mean, if you're close enough that you're involved in the wedding, maybe you're one of the the bridesmaid, the best man. You've had a tight relationship. You do a lot of things together. You've done a lot of things together. And all of a sudden, here comes this other person somewhere in the mix. And now they're getting married. 
now if I'm the friend, that relationship is changing. This other person is going to be number one. And our friendship will still be there, but it's going to be different. And there may be a sense of loss even. But if you really love your friend, you're going to be so excited for their, their joy. And that's where John's at. He has this relationship that Jesus is increasing. I mean, Jesus has now come on the scene, and he is excited that Jesus is coming on the scene. His role is to move into the background and Jesus to increase. I just think it's a really neat illustration. And then he, in the second part of this, I'd like somebody, well, do we have a mic handy already? Would somebody read verses 31 through 36? You step up to the mic or thank you, Lawrence. Now, before you read it, I, I would just like you to imagine this is John speaking to his disciples. I want you to imagine that uh, I didn't tell you that, you didn't see it, and envision this as Jesus talking and see if you can see any distinction here. Go ahead, Lawrence. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son, and the Son has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Thank you. Does that last part of that sound like we, what we just heard in John 3.16? It may not be word for word, but he's talking... Well, the whole thing, you just spend some time on it. It sounds like other passages from Jesus. Uh, exactly. And again, uh, notice at the very end of it, whoever believes has eternal life, but whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Not that it comes on him. It remains on him. So we're in a, sin, we're, we're in a place of sin until we believe in Jesus that won't spend a lot of time on this right now but I, I just that struck me because one of the themes that I want to chase as we go through um, has to do with this idea of the father that Jesus talks about over and over as we get into some of the longer te teachings or dialogues and he says the word the father a lot not my father our father he says the father and we'll talk about that more later but over and over, he reinforces this idea to his, in his teachings that he is one with the Father, that they are one. He's from the Father. His authority comes from the Father. He's going to the Father. <clears throat> He's one with the Father. And you get this picture with John the Baptist here. Is John in sync with Jesus and the Father or what? At least in this passage, uh, you get the sense of here's someone that, that understands and has become totally committed and totally in sync his mind and his teaching. I mean, can't, I can't even imagine, personally. Maybe that's too strong a word. But that seems so far beyond me. To think of being that much in sync, that my immediate response to things is exactly what the Father's response would be. I would aspire to that, but it's just, it's just, and so he's there. My, my point is we go through John, and I'll be interested to get your all's take on it as we have more time for discussion. <clears throat> is the dialogue in John shifts as you go farther into it. Not that Jesus isn't one, but especially towards 16, 17. Then Jesus talks, starts talking about how the disciples are one. And, not, and I guess I've always read that as one with each other, like fellowship, unity. I guess I'd not connected it in the sense of how Jesus is talking about one with the Father. I mean, that makes sense. It's logical. I just hadn't spent that there. So he's moving his, try, moving his disciples to a place that he's at. And it's John. And I just thought, thought the illustration with John was kind of interesting. 
Then let's see. We are going to do a little bit of four. Jump around a little bit there. And four. When Jesus learns of the Pharisees, this is kind of kind of an interesting way it's said. When he learn learned that the Pharisees have learned that he's baptizing more than John, Jesus moves on. And I guess this probably fits in with the idea. Usually, when there's a crowd getting too big, Jesus moves on. Maybe maybe that's part of it. But the the only point I want to mention on the way he passed through Samaria. So we we've now gone from we started in Cana, we went to Jerusalem for the Passover. Now we're going back to Cana. We'll end up there at the end of the chapter. But we're stopping in Samaria. And there's a passage that says, in this section in 4, 1 through 6, Jesus was weary from the journey. And <clears throat> this is another, just a little thing thrown in there, but I think it's, it indicates, how, or it reflects how John goes back and forth between Jesus' deity and his humanity, I think. And there's a whole study, Danny and I've talked about it, so I'm, I'm very interested in, I haven't chased it as much as I like, but Jesus refers to himself as the son of man quite frequently. And what that means is something, if any of you studied, I'd like to talk about later. But when I did dig, dig into it a little bit, that too is an, it's a whole interesting study because almost exclusively, Jesus is the only one to use that term about himself. John does a couple times, but very little is that phrase used. Even though when I think of Jesus, the son of man, that's a very common phrase. It's all, almost all in the Gospels, and it's Jesus referring to himself. The son of man came to do this. Son. I mean, there's a couple exceptions, so don't mean that. Then you go to the Old Testament. This is what intrigued me. You don't see it in the Old Testament, except in a couple little, like Isaiah prophecy. But where you see it all the time is Ezekiel. Over 90 times. See, about the only place, there's only a couple other places in the entire Old Testament. And in that one, it's God speaking to Ezekiel and calling him the Son of Man. That's mind twister we won't speak, but just throw that in for free. Okay. We're going to skip the Samaritan woman for just a second. The disciples try to give Jesus food down in 31, and he says he has food from the Father. We're moving almost back into the spiritual kind of thing, the deity thing. I have food from the Father. I don't. Leads to discussion about reaping and sowing. Uh, and then we end up in 39 through 42. Many Samaritans, most of us know the story, the woman after she talks to Jesus goes to the town and shares. We'll come back to that. Many Samaritans from the town believed because of the woman, and they asked Jesus to stay. And after that, more people believed. And this says, not just because of what you said, the woman said, but now we have seen and we've heard for ourselves. So you kind of have this step up in faith. We're going to do just briefly the Samaritan woman. And then we're going to watch a video because I just think it illustrates it so well. Um, so a woman, Jesus is weary. He's resting by Jacob's well. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Like most people say it's around, you know, it's noon, one o'clock, heat of the day. She, by all cases, she's by herself. Uh, Jesus asked her for a drink. I'm going to let the video show this. But in this, we find out Jesus knows the woman's past. And one thing we're learning through John, Jesus seems to know things. He knew where Nathaniel was at. And now he knows all about this woman. And I love how it's portrayed, not to build up this video too much, but how it's expanded upon in, in this video. Because I've, I've always looked at this and I've got, well, anybody could have known she had five husbands. I mean, she's probably you know, uh, well-known around the community for, for bouncing around from husband to husband. Who, I mean, who knows how that all played out? Maybe they all died. Not but anybody could have known that. But in the video, it, it goes deeper, and he tells things that, that really shake her up. Second thing that comes out in this is Jesus tells her twice in verse 21, 23, the hour is coming. And we'll, again, mentioned that last week. We're going to see that just continue to come up that about this idea that the hour is coming, has come. And then uh, Jesus, through this, reveals that he's a mess Messiah. And it's phrased a little different than how we normally hear, I am. 
in the SV and the NX, uh, New American Standard is not much different. He says, I also speak to you. I who speak to you am he. But the word Greek word is really I am. They go with me. So this is one of those other places where I am is used the Greek. That's not a metaphor. I was talking about last week. There's really more than seven I am's in John. So we're going to come back to, and we have just enough time. We're going to come back to this video. Uh, I want you to look at it, whether, you know, this is a stretch or not. I, th I, th I think we all agree. I mean, I know you all pretty well. It is, it's not only fun, but I think it's helpful to look at a passage and try to look at where people were at at the time. And, and it just, because you're reading a few sentences, sometimes it's just so, you know, it's easy to look at things as black and white. And when you think about somebody in her position, and not only as a Samaritan, and here's a Jew, Jew, not only as a woman and a man speaking to her, but here's someone who's probably not respected very much because of her past. We really don't know the details of her past, but you can imagine, especially in that society, I mean, even even today, if someone walked in and they, they had been married five times and they were living with somebody else, you might I mean, love that person, you know, accept, but you still might have a little question: Is there, you know, what, there seems to be a problem here? And so this this uh, video explores that. And if you would start that, I'm going to sit down, and then that that pretty much wrap out our class, and I'm did it again. We don't have time to talk. Well, now that everybody's, uh, after you're through crying, we can start worship. I have, that's, that's such a fantastic scene to me, the whole, whole portrayal, you know, it's a hard one to watch. I mean, we, uh, we can understand, if not personally through people that we've known that have had that kind of shame and and to think how Jesus speaks to her. I love the line when he says, you know, I came here just for you. Isn't that, isn't that cool? Anyway. Next week, Doc is going to lead us in five through six. He's got some really neat ideas on fate and hope and tying that into some of the, in particular, to some of the miracles. So he'll be covering that and then we'll continue on probably a couple chapters a week after that. And again... Hopefully we'll get through a lot of this background stuff. We would have had time to talk today, but I saw the video, you know, Friday night. And so I got to show it. Uh, thank you.